Thanks for clicking on this video. I'm Eli Mann with the Beltline Church of Christ. If you're like me and you're not big into the world of sports, the name I'm about to say probably won't ring any bells for you or mean anything to you. But if you're big into sports and big into the world of basketball, the name I'm about to say is probably one you've heard before, and for good reason. Uh, the, the person I want to talk about for a second is a man named John Wooden. Now, like I said, if you're like me and you're not big into sports, you, you probably won't recognize this name, but uh, a story about him popped up on my Facebook a few days ago, and, and it interested me. And, and the reason it interested me was, was it was talking about how John Wooden, in his time at, at coaching at UCLA, he, he coached there for 12 years, and within uh, 10 of those 12 years, he won the national championship with his team. Now, e even for people like me who, who aren't big into sports, we recognize that's a big deal. That doesn't happen often, if ever at all. And so John Wooding being able to pull this off is a huge deal. So when we think of John Wooden and his coaching style, we must think, man, this guy must have been super tough on his players from day one. You know, the, the first day they must have been memorizing plays or, or running some of the most advanced drills so that later in the season, those, those advanced drills would be nothing to them. That they'd know them like the back of their hand and they'd be able to perform on this high level super early in the season. But John Wooden actually had an entirely different approach to uh, how he trained up his players from the beginning of the season. You see, John Wooden, the first practice of every season, instead of having his players run drills or, or do anything like that, he would go into the locker room with his, uh, with his players with a pair of socks and a pair of shoes, and, and the entire first practice would be this... Uh, practicing how to put your socks on and how to tie your shoes in the right way. Now, for most of us, that, that sounds kind of dumb. Like, you, you learn how to put on your socks and shoes when you're a kid. Why, why do you need to learn it again when you're 18 to 22 playing college basketball? But, you see, John Wooden understood something that, that, we, do, that we don't, that we didn't. And it's that the socks and shoes are the most interacted with equipment that a basketball player has. You know, people like us would often think it's the balls, but no, it's the socks and the shoes. And how you put them on and how you interact with them affects your game. If you put the sock on wrong, there's a chance you could wear a blister onto your foot and you might have trouble running the next game or two while that heals. There's also a chance that uh, if the shoe's not tied right, you're more prone to, to rolling or twisting your ankle, putting you out for a few games down the road until you're able to, to heal up from that injury. And so John Wooden understood that spending valuable time in the first practice covering the basics of how to use the equipment would save them so much time and, and make them better players at the end of the season than going in automatically starting difficult drills. And, and I think that that's a principle that can be applied to our Christianity, that can be applied to our faith. Moving back to the basics, forgetting deep theological ideas, and moving back to some of the basic principles of Christianity. So that later down the line, later down in our season, we might be able to, to be better players because we've covered the basics again. And so that, that's kind of what I want to do today, is go back to one of the basic ideas of our Christian faith and see what it's all about. Get a firm understanding of that so that later down the line, we can be stronger in our faith. And the question that I want to ask today, the, the basic principle that I want to look at, is who is this man called Jesus, and why do we worship him? Who is this man called Jesus, and why do we worship him? You know, for a lot of us, we, we probably had an answer pop into our head immediately. And, and Jesus defines himself multiple times throughout Scripture, so I want us to go and look at, at one of those times. Uh, particularly in Matthew chapter 21. Uh, it's only three verses, uh, Matthew 21 verses 42 through 44. But in these verses, Jesus gives us a very deep and meaningful description of who he is and why we should worship him. But to understand these three verses, we, we have to understand the mindset Jesus is coming from when he, when he says what he says here. You see, th this is after Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's in the last week of his life knowing his crucifixion is about to go, uh, is about to happen. He's in the last week of his life knowing that the crucifixion is about to happen. And so 
while Jesus is in Jerusalem, he decides to spend his time teaching and studying with the people who were there. And so, uh, uh, a few of the Pharisees, a few of the spiritual leaders of the Jewish church don't like what Jesus is doing. They don't like what he's teaching. And so they come up and they say, by whose authority are you teaching this? Well, Jesus does what he normally does, and he gives them a few parables to answer. But then after the parables, uh, he says what he says in verse 42. So let's begin reading. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. You know, uh, the, these three verses, when they're isolated, when, when we don't go into an in-depth study, uh, these verses might go straight over our head. They might not make sense. But Jesus is actually quoting two Old Testament scriptures in this passage. A and understanding these two Old Testament scriptures gives us a clear idea of who Jesus is and why we should worship him and be a part of him. The first of these references comes in verse 42 when Jesus says the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Uh, th this section of scripture comes from Psalm 118. So let's go over and, and look at there. Uh, Psalm 118 starting in 19 and going through verse 24. So to, to understand this psalm, we, we have to look at the whole picture. And so when we look at the beginning of Psalm 118, it's talking about a battle that the writer is doomed to lose. Him and his men are surrounded. They're outnumbered. They're outmanned. There's no way that they should be able to survive this. But through prayer and through being followers of God, God takes mercy on them and shows them that, that he's there, he's on their side, and delivers them from this powerful enemy, from a battle they should have lost. And so uh, the, the psalmist realizes this, him, him and his men realize this, and they're like, okay, we understand. We understand that God has done this, and God is worthy of our praise because he saves us each and every day. And so they go to the temple to, to worship God, and as they're going to the temple, they, they come up on this gate, and this is what the psalmist says, starting in verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You see, we're able to see in verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. But the cornerstone of what? And that's answered for us in verse 19. And it's this cornerstone is our way into righteousness. It's a cornerstone of the gate of righteousness. You see, the, the Jewish idea when they were entering into the temple, when they were entering through this gate of righteousness, is that only the righteous people, only the people that, that serve God and worship him in a true and right manner are the ones that can walk through this gate. So you have to be righteous to begin to, to even enter this gate. But then as you walk through it, as you walk through this gate of righteousness into the presence of God, you're automatically made more righteous. Not because you've done anything, not because you've become the best of the best, but just entering through this gate, entering into the presence of God to worship him makes you more righteous. And so when we go back to Matthew 21 and Jesus is quoting the scripture and pointing towards himself, we understand that, that the gate of righteousness that's at the temple isn't going to serve that role anymore. You see, the gate of righteousness that we have to enter to become uh, more righteous and enter into the presence of God, that's not a stone archway anymore. That gate of righteousness is entering through Jesus. So for us to enter through Jesus, Enter into Jesus is for us to become righteous and enter into the presence of God. Jesus is our gate of righteousness, our one way to become more righteous than we could ever be and to enter into the presence of God. And that's who he is. He is the gate of righteousness. He's the cornerstone and the foundation of our way into eternal life. 
a way into the presence of the creator, this almighty being that we can't fathom here on earth. And that's who God, or that's who Jesus really is. The gate of righteousness, our one true entrance into the presence of God. But that, that isn't where Jesus leaves it. That, that's not the only Old Testament reference. You see, in Matthew 21, 44, uh, he starts talking about a stone that will uh, destroy anyone who trips on it or crush anyone that it falls on. And this is a reference to Daniel chapter 2. This is a chapter that we go to a lot when we look at Daniel and the role he played in, in God's Old Testament reign. When we see uh, the, the kingdom of Israel, uh, Daniel is often a figure that we go to, and Daniel chapter 2 is one that we go to, to to see Daniel's power and how God works through him. Now, in, in Daniel chapter 2, th this is a chapter where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Uh, it's a dream he doesn't understand, and it's a dream that scares him. And so he goes to his wise men, and he asks, uh, tell me what my dream is, and then interpret it for me. Well, well, his wise men say, Nebuchadnezzar, we, we can't really do that. You have to tell us what your dream was for us to interpret it. And Nebuchadnezzar was like, no, th this dream is way too important. If you are really wise men, if you will know the true interpretation, you'll also know what the dream was without me telling you. A and if you aren't able to tell me, guess what? You're all going to die. Well, this news starts to, to spread through Babylon and, and uh, all the wise men get scared. They're like, we can't interpret this dream with, without knowing what it was. And, and so uh, all these wise men begin to fear for their lives because they're not going to be able to interpret this dream. And, and because of that, Nebuchadnezzar will kill them. But then uh, out of nowhere, uh, uh, Daniel comes up and he's like, I know what the dream was and I know how to interpret it. God, guide me. Tell me what the dream was and tell me what it means. And so that's exactly what happens. Daniel goes into Nebuchadnezzar and tells him the dream and tells him what it means. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 36, we're able to see what the dream means. So, so let's, beginning, let's begin reading there. Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given. Wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks into pieces and shatters all things. And like that iron crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. But they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in these days... And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this? The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. So in this chapter, we're, we're able to see Daniel come forward and tell Nebuchadnezzar, there's your dream. There was this huge statue, head of gold, uh, chest of silver, thighs of, of bronze, and, and calves and feet of iron, and then a little clay at the bottom. And, and you're the head of gold, and there's going to be a kingdom after you, a kingdom after them, and another kingdom after them. And they're all going to be great. They're all going to be these massive empires with so much power. But then out of, out of nowhere, that there's this giant stone cut straight out of a mountain that no man could make. And, and this stone comes in and crushes all these great kingdoms. That there's no way that any other kingdom would survive or, or even uh, compare to this mountain. 
compare to this stone, compare to this kingdom. There's no way any kingdom could be even close to what this kingdom is. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 21, verse 44. He's pointing to this kingdom, this stone in Daniel chapter 2. And he's saying, nothing can compare to that. And guess what? I and that stone, I made that stone be a part of the kingdom. I'm your way into that kingdom. I made it. I can bring you in. So let me bring you in. And that's what God, or that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 21, verse 44. That this stone that that comes out of nowhere in Daniel chapter 2 is the stone that Jesus has created and the kingdom that he set up during his time on earth. And it's the kingdom that we have today. It's the kingdom that, that we take part of each and every day in our lives when we interact with our Christian brothers and sisters. That kingdom is the church. Why wouldn't we want to be a part of this kingdom that's so much greater than any other kingdom? That has been, that will be, that currently is. The kingdom of the church is the greatest kingdom that we could ever be a part of. So why wouldn't we want to be a part of it? So who is this Jesus and why do we worship him? Well, like like, uh, Jesus pointed out in Matthew 21 verse 42, he's the cornerstone of the gate of righteousness. He's our one true way to become righteous beings and to enter into the presence of God. And then he's the founder of the greatest kingdom the world has ever seen. He's the founder of the church. And that kingdom, the the church, is greater than any other nation that the world has ever seen, ever is seeing, and ever will see. So why wouldn't we want to be a part of it? Why wouldn't we want to worship this being that put himself on a cross so that we can enter into the presence of God and become righteous beings? And and why wouldn't we want to worship the being who set up the church, the greatest kingdom the world has ever seen? That's why we worship God. He's our one true way into righteousness, and he is the founder of the greatest kingdom the world has ever seen. If you've you've known this for a while and, and you're just brushing up on this, that's great. I'm glad you can hear the message. But if this is your first time hearing this and you want to study more, you want to study more about this person who is our way into eternal life with our creator and is the uh, founder of the best kingdom the world has ever seen, please get in contact with us in any way possible so that we can, we can connect with you and study with you more about this. Let's pray. Dear God, we, we come before your throne and we're humbled by the mercy and grace that you showed for us when he sent Jesus down on this earth to die for us. We, we understand that he's our one true way into righteousness, and we understand that he created the best kingdom this world has ever seen. Please let us become a part of him and enter into this kingdom that he's created and, and become a part of it and become a part of you in doing so. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.